because you're jumping back into the gut. Oh, let's hey, go. Coach. Welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. I appreciate you joining us for this week's podcast. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit basketballimmersion.com for more coaching resources and access to all the basketball podcasts. I hope you will give us a shout out on social media on Twitter at Bball Immersion or on Instagram at Basketball Immersion to help me continue to share the game. Enjoy the episode. Coach is super excited to have Trevor Gleason here. Since joining the Perth Wildcats in 2013, Coach Gleason has become the club's most successful coach, making the finals in every season and claiming five championships. He is the only Wildcats coach to win multiple championships at the club. And in December 2019, he became the eighth coach in NBL history to reach 400 games. Coach, excited to have you here. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Looking forward to it. Incredible success. And, you know, I've certainly followed that league for a while and uh, I've heard tremendous things about you and coaching and everything with it. And one thing that stands out and the thing that we're going to talk about is that you run Flex. And uh, I'm just curious to start maybe your background with Flex. Yeah, well, it started uh, early 2000, really. I used to coach against a legend coach over here, Lindsay Gaze's system, and he ran the shuffle, and it really upset me that I'd make a mistake and I'd give a layup up all the time. And I looked at my offense, which was more of a, a power set or floppy set, and I thought, well, they if the defense make a mistake, I'm getting open for a 15-foot jump shot. I said, I don't want to do that. I want to get a layup like – they do with the uh, shuffle from the Melbourne Tigers. So, And around that time, I was watching a lot of international basketball and I seen Argentina just won the, I think they won the Olympics in 2004, or running some shuffle, 2006 World Championships at the semifinal again. And So I started to play around with the flex in early days when I was in Townsville Crocodiles in 2006. And it kind of started off as a, a, a secondary offense to flowing into our offense earlier, and then it's just evolved. And now there's over 50 different plays out of that set. So, uh, yeah, it was really to get an easy basket from the defense making a mistake. And we really know that first flex cut is really to check the defense. It's We know we're not going to score on it a lot of the times, but we do get it once or twice in a game. and Sometimes in a pressure situation that the defense is playing that tight and we get a layup for their mistakes. And, yeah, that's how it evolved. And uh, Oh, sorry, that's how it started. And I've certainly taken um, Lithuania, played a lot of the flex at the 2014 World Championships in Spain. I, I stole plenty of ideas out of that. And sometimes we just adapt out of that one four set. Tremendous stuff and good to know the flex is alive and well. And of course it is alive and well because a lot of the aspects of the flex still exist in different ways. But what you're talking about is still running kind of the pattern of flex as a, I assume, a spacing template. And then from there, players get flexibility and freedom. Yeah, without a question. We we have a lot of freedom for the players. Look, we want to kick ahead. We want to play a fast pace. We actually pass the ball into the post a ton of times. You know, we're looking for 20 hits in the post a game. And we've got cutters off that. We've got screen. We've got uh, step-ups for the for the five-man stepping up off the block and a handoff of the shooter coming off that. You know, I, I really think, you know, the modern game is, is more five out, especially in America and we, we like to play the post. We like to play the short corner where we get cutters. We get different angles to work on. We've got defense. have got to change their position and guarding areas. And and we talk about the first flex cut. We talk about the second side. We get most of our action through the second side. We're breaking down the defense. Now they've got to cut, uh, sorry, defend multiple cuts, multiple down screens, multiple ball reversals. That's when the defense starts to break open and when we can maintain our spacing and the guys have got a free, you know, a green light to to play what's in front of them at that stage. So watching, having watched some clips and watched your team 
a lot preparing for this. You guys have great spacing. And is the flex non-traditional modern spacing in the sense that you're not always spacing deep corners? Or what are some of the spacing keys that you guys use? Yeah, but technically we don't get a lot of uh, deep corner threes. I know that's probably going against. We get more of our wing threes where the spacing's a little bit different and, and it's not flattened out. But the spacing is the key because if the defense wants to get aggressive, and there's two ways they can really play the traditional flex is the first pass is deny the trail of the ball to stop the first cut. And we have options where they, we back cut straight through that and then we flash the post into the high point guard area and we have our second side. Act. And that's really the counter, the defense, what they want to take away from that. And that's our spacing is crucial and different plays require you to be different spots, maybe at the elbow, maybe at the split line, maybe deep in the corner to create space. and. What we want to do is to get our best player the ball at the right time and give him the enough space to work with if they're going to try hard show a pick and roll, make sure we have some outlets and some counters against that. Yeah, I like that. And uh, curious then, you've talked about a few things that are important. So what are the keys to running the flexes, the speed of cuts, the decisions, the quality of the screens? What are some of the keys that you find in the modern game? Yeah, you got to cut hard. You, you can't, you know, just cruise through it and not be live on the cuts. The cuts are, have to be set up and, you know, on the second side you have a choice of going low or high and, and we've got to keep that defence honest. And there's all the intricacies of, of working with an offence. It's if they're going to switch, let's keep them high. If they're going to go under, let's seal them. If they go over the top, let's throw it at the rim. And that's the angles, the timing, and the spots we want to set the screens is really important that we create that spacing. And when we do that, we create opportunities. And that's something that we work on every day. Um, you know, a, a lot of times that we, you know, do some drills where it's no bar, uh, no bouncing the ball. We've got to work on our cuts, we angles, our spacing, our quick ball movement, just so the guys can see where the opportunities arise in their offense. And then we lighten that up and allow one dribble that they can attack off the dribble um, so they can be aware of their teammates and where they're going to be and what spots is going to open up when the defense helps. Well, it's tremendous watching because I can see the speed of the cuts and how often that just frees a player. And the other thing that becomes aware is that ghosting screens or running through screens becomes a part of this modern offense for you guys as well, right? Where you're not always setting the screen. No, and that's if you get a hard cut, the defender has to help off the ball. Otherwise, you get a layup. And that's that's why I like it so much that if the defense just takes a, a wrong move or gets his vision caught, you know, he's given up a layup and that's what, uh, you know, when you get those easy points, it's really demoralising for the defensive team to play this good pressure, but then you're giving up layups. And uh, we, we work on cutting a lot. We emphasise that. We emphasise the flex cut is hard and then we've got a guard coming down setting the screen for the big that could be a three-point shooter and uh, maybe we're, we're screening our own man to create that you know, that open three-point shot for our big guy who can shoot. We're going to come back because you mentioned practice and some of the things that you do to work on this. But just out of that, let's go to the pure, the flex screen part of it and that interior screen. What are you teaching in terms of the screening rules there for your screener? Do you mean off the, the first flex cut off the block? Yeah, like just on the baseline, the baseline flex screen. Yeah, so we want our post guy, and obviously he's a post target. Everyone's a post target there. And when that pass goes from the guard to the trailer, we want him to step off the block, and we want to cut more times than not on the baseline side. And that's where we get the speed. And sometimes we cut underneath the basket, and a lot of times we catch the ball and we've got to do a reverse mic and to finish the layup. We don't want to catch the ball then turn around and square up to the ring for the cutter. And it, it's a quick hit. So we want to step on the block, step off the block and set that screen. And now if they switch that, we can seal 
the big on the inside, you've got the guard on the outside, so that we're always looking for those first options. And that's always to test the defence. Is the defence good? If it's good, we go to the next part. We give it a quick look. Very important for our trailer to have the ball ready to pass the ball and his vision is on the cutter. Like a few times we haven't got a good passer up top there that is open, but he doesn't see it. So he has to get past some pressure and make sure that he can hit two targets, the cutter and the screener. Uh, And then we have some multiple, you know, multiple reads off that. Hey coach, just a brief interruption of the podcast to hear from one of our supporters. There is no shortage of action going on with our partners over at betonline.ag. The sports world is slow making its way back with the NBA announcing its return in late July. But right now, UFC, boxing, NASCAR, and international soccer have all resumed play. And BetOnline has the best odds, lines for their upcoming games and matches. Need more? BetOnline has simulated an NFL, NBA, and UFC happening live every day for our devote gamblers to check out. BetOnline also offers hundreds of live casino games, poker tournaments, and the best props in the business. Visit BetOnline.ag on your computer or mobile device and join now to receive your welcome bonus. BetOnline.ag, your online wagering experts. Now back to the podcast. You said the baseline side. So what? What? why has that become the major emphasis on that in the first cut or is that on every type of baseline cut? Is that because no, that, of where the defense on- forces? Yeah, no, we want to flatten out the defense. So if we can go baseline, typically when people or teams defend it, they want to push us into the screen and bump us. We find the baseline cut is faster. We find we get more options out of that. And it's not every single time we must go baseline. We'll obviously take what the defense gives us. But if we have a choice, we want to cut baseline hard so it flattens out the defense. And then the defender on the post normally has to open up. Now, he has to open up with arms out, try to stop that layup happening. And that's when if you've got a a big post guy, he can seal him, he can duck in, and then you've got your option. Or if he's got a three-point shot, after that screen, he can go straight to the perimeter. And now he's already got separation from his defender because of that hard cut along the baseline. I think... What we've found when he cuts across the top, uh, more physical, uh, it's slower. So uh, we want to get through that first cut so it opens up our second line cuts as much as possible. That's great. And, and as you're talking about this, you're talk, you've already talked about a finish at the rim and in a, in a traditional way that you might get a finish at the rim. The other thing that comes when, from watching your film is how good some of your players need to be at coming off of screens and squaring and shooting, which again is not as much a part of the modern offense where most of it comes off the dribble kick out and already facing the rim. Is that got to be something you recruit for or that you really develop within player development? Yeah, that, that's a good question. That's, that's something that we work on individually and in our footwork, you know, it's not only footwork that you work on defense sliding and you're pivoting and you're adjusting from weak side to help side to deny but it's really on offense because the better footwork that you have the faster you become that means the shot can get up quicker and and against you know professional athletes and and, you know guys that are long in length can get there and block the shot if you've got good footwork you're quicker and as soon as you do that you're a much better um, a threat from the perimeter. So, yeah, we, we set the screen and we want two quick steps straight up. So we'll set out on the screen, make sure we get in contact. As soon as, the, you know, the basic shoulder-to-shoulder cutter goes, you know, we're looking to come off that pin down and ready to shoot. Footwork is a big part. We work on that every day with pivoting, inside pivot, outside pivot, and probably stole a lot from... Uh, you know, the Tex winner from the triangle that used to do that a, a fair bit with their offense. Love that. And obviously the importance of footwork in all of basketball, but definitely in that case, it's, it's, it's great to hear and great to see. And uh, with that, then driving opportunities, where do you find the most dribble drive opportunities come out of this type of offense now? Yeah, we have a, a drive and drift set. We, 
in a traditional flex positions and we drive on the post towards a baseline that's live and we're drifting on the other opposite 45 getting to the corner and the big guy is either at the rim or he gets straight to the three-point line. So on the strong side guard, yes, he's got the freedom to take his man to the rim. If he goes through the elbows, our big will pop to the short corner, our opposite wing will go to the corner, so he has those opportunities. But everybody on that offense that are facing the basket have the ability to go off the dribble, and we certainly use that, and we use that a lot more this year just to open up our offense, and we had a little bit more perimeter players that could take their guy off the dribble, and it creates opportunities. And we go into our drive and then drift rules of our spacing, getting the extra pass, and there's a lot of options out of that dribble drive. Yeah, no, I love that. And that's such a key part to any offense nowadays, and certainly with the quality of players that you deal with as well. So, Coach, I'm wondering if you get any skip opportunities to the weak side, particularly to the player who sets that baseline screen. Yeah, we do. And that's we really look in for our bigs to, to seal. Uh, if he sets a great screen, that's when he's got the inside position on the guard or if they're they, um, switching defences, even from the big to the little, if they switch that. You know, we, we talk about setting the screen, sealing your man and giving that for a quick look. If he goes under and stays with the flex cutter, the big has the ability to step in to his defender and seal him again with his uh, back to the basket. So if you've got a big post player, we, uh, we certainly take advantage of that. And we've had some really good post players that, uh, that love to seal, and it's a good opportunity to do that. But again, that's the hard flex cut that creates that opportunity. You don't cut hard, you won't get that look. Yeah, great point. Great point there. And that's obviously something you you emphasize a lot. And the thing I'm thinking, particularly for youth coaches, like I always thought flex and still do is a tremendous youth offense because multiple positions and you get to learn different things, different skill sets out of different situations. But what what recommendations do you have to coaches that find that the flex becomes too too spot to spot, too patterned? Yeah, and I actually did that. I coached juniors and I found that it wasn't they, they didn't grasp um, the reads and the counters. So I would say start off with having a counter straight away. So if your guard comes down and is going to pass to the trailer, what happens if that's taken away? So we cut hard to the basket and then we lift our post guy and, and the point guard dribbles across to the other side and we start the flex on the other side of the floor. It's just those basic counters so it doesn't get stuck. And maybe running a strong side action where you pass to the post and it could be a UCLA cut or getting into the wheel offense. But what you want to do at the end of the day in juniors is teach the guys to play what's in front of them and not so much a pattern. Have a pattern to get your spacing and to uh, get the ball to the right people's hand. But you want to be able to read on the screens down, on the hard cuts, on give and go, on the back screens you know, on the pin down and catching and squaring up and getting a good shot release and having great offensive rebounding coverage. And I think you don't get so fixated on you must get second flex cut, third flex cut. I think just slow that down and, and teach the kids how to play what's in front of them. Yeah, great advice there. And you mentioned offensive rebounding too. And can you talk about that, the advantage of offensive rebounding out of the flex? Yeah, it gives us great coverage. You know, we normally we have um, the post guy in there, either ball side or on the weak side. So we got one right there. Our second guy is our wing guy. Uh, he has the freedom to crash that as hard as possible. Um, if he can't get it, we want to look for the tap outs. So we send three and a half to rim every time. We don't particularly um, want our shooting guard in there, but our point guard and its personnel base, our, per, our point guard 
has a great nose for the ball. He reads it in the flight of the air. He doesn't get caught with his feet in concrete, watching the ball. He's active. So we want our point guard to, to get up there and get in there for the rebound as well. So with traditionally the three-man, the point guard, and our five-man uh, ideally in there, and our four-man should be around the high post for the long rebounds. The flip side of keeping our point guard there, they get the ball and he can pick up full court. We run our, our shooting guard back as much as possible, as often as we can. So he's got coverage down and we work from there. But, yeah, we certainly want three and a half on the glass every single time. Yeah, very cool to see kind of all that come together. And then maybe the other part that goes with it is, like, how early are you introducing, you know, when there's the down screen and there's the baseline screen, how early are you introducing the variability of those cuts? Like, it, I call it a convergence because basically the one cutter has – multiple decisions are they getting freedom right away in your system to be able to go wherever they want whether they reject and go up or they use the flex screen yeah that's the beauty of it when the guys are familiar with it so i've already done a flex cut so i'm on the low post and i've got a wing outside and they're two guards uh, a three man and a two man and that's when the eye vision and the synergy comes in and said hey you know you come off that pin down i'll cut baseline or I'll come over on the top. And that's when it's fun when they're starting to read that and play off each other. And and the more they play, the more they get that freedom. But to start off with, we'll have a call for it just so they understand the spacing, uh, who's going to the ball, who's going to the rim. But, yeah, we have multiple reads where they do have the freedom to read their defense. But we also have a couple of quick, short, shock clock situations where we certainly want the flex cut to either come back off the first flex cut or come off the pin down from the trailer. Love it. Love it. And that's, that's when obviously you're starting to have fun because they're getting that next level too. And uh, uh, that's great. And uh, we coach, obviously a big part about the flex is handling switches. So can we spend some time talking about some of the different ways that you counter switching? Yeah, without a question. It's, it's uh it's moved quite frequently these days that uh, they'll switch, um, you know, everything from the first flex cut, from the pin down, you know, and we, we certainly do have some counters in there, how we want to go about that. And we try to put certain defenders in positions that they have to make a read out of that. So, yeah, no, no worries. Let's get into it. Hey coach, just a brief interruption of the podcast to hear from one of our supporters. There is no shortage of action going on with our partners over at betonline.ag. The sports world is slow making its way back with the NBA announcing its return in late July, but right now UFC, boxing, NASCAR, and international soccer have all resumed play and BetOnline has the best odds, lines for their upcoming games and matches. Need more? BetOnline has simulated an NFL, NBA, and UFC happening live every day for our devote gamblers to check out. Bet Online also offers hundreds of live casino games, poker tournaments, and the best props in the business. Visit betonline.ag on your computer or mobile device and join now to receive your welcome bonus. Betonline.ag, your online wagering experts. Now back to the podcast. So, uh, yeah, I mean, one of the advantages of switching at least that first flex screen the baseline screen is that uh, we can keep the big at the rim in theory, right? So I'm imagining what you're trying to do is find a way to exploit a little on big or a big on little matchup. And with that, which would be your preference? Yeah, it really depends what you want. Like we're very strong. We have a great point, uh, sorry, a great shooting guard. So we're, we'll run him off little to big screens. And if they want to, mismatch and switch that and then they've got a four or five man on our two guard we'll facilitate that and make sure the floor is stretched and then we've got two options out of that we either got the guard who can take the big guy on him or we can dump it inside with our four or five man on a two guard so we get the switches quite often most teams don't switch the first flex cut. They will switch the pin down where they've got the guard 
uh, switching back on the big and keeping the big at the rim. So there's some they might get up there and deny those lines, and that's when we got some dribble handoffs. You know, some areas out of there that we want to attack. That's great. And uh, do, do you incorporate any ball screening into this offense? Yeah, late clock we do. It's not something that we initiate straight on like uh, the trailer will come in and get the point guard straight away. And we will get into our loop series where we loop the wing around and then the trailer will come into the on ball. We pass the ball back to the trailer and he passes it straight to the opposite wing and follows that with an on ball. And that, that's a big play for us because we find teams will either trap or hard show uh, out of that and then we can pop our four-man to the corner for a three-point shot uh, and then they're in long rotations. Um, if they get into a switch out of that with the, with the on-ball, we look to post up and, and drag the big goer up higher and look for our options out of that as well. Um, there is a lot of guys that we find, some guys don't like uh, a pick and roll late clock because it's a chance to trap them with eight seconds to go. So if that's a mismatch, we'll most likely separate the floor uh, and let him attack or pass it into the post. But we also have a, a three-man that's really good at the pick and roll um, that wants the pick and roll and can play out of it. So it's very much uh, personnel base that we want the pick and roll. So you mentioned the shot clock, and I guess it's curious to me coming back to this, it, is there an ideal average length? Or are you finding there's an average length of possession that happens usually like obviously you'll take what you can get cheap early if you can, but are you finding after that, that your possessions last a little longer or a little shorter than other offenses? And it's funny, just doing some research with this beforehand, I, I went back this last season and our most common offense is what we call the second side, which is one flex cutter, two flex cutters, and then you're into the offense. And, that also has a chance to break the defense down. You know, the defense is going to play pretty strong for the first six to eight seconds. You know, they might have scored down the other end, uh, be angry down the other end, something didn't happen. So they're going to play defense for the first six or eight seconds unless they're really bad. But then they start to break down. Then you get to the communication on the cut. Are they supposed to switch and there's a miscommunication? So we find anywhere from the around about the 12-second mark to about the uh, six-second mark. We get a lot of opportunities out of that because our movement and our cutters. And late clock, we, you know, late clock, we're, we're talking about six seconds, five seconds, and we're really spacing the floor and making sure the guy's not throwing a hand grenade. No, and, that, and that's, uh, you know, we have some short clock, it changed a couple of years ago when the FIBA went to 14 seconds on a rebound. So we have a lot of short clock offenses out of that, quick hitters. Um, but we get a lot of our stuff on the second side. So you talked about second side. Is that a play call for you guys where you're, you're trying to run two, two flex screen actions before you're really trying to attack to move the defense? Yeah, we, we get – yeah, we – Second side is like it's probably if I go to old school here, it might be like who's he is with four passes before your attack. Second it's side, it's not that old school, two. coach. It's not that old school. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it it just gets you know if we need to get somebody or everybody a touch of the ball to get involved the game, we'll do it. We don't really like the you know isolation and no one touches the ball for three minutes because one person gets it. We we want to get the ball moving. We want to get uh, move the defense. We want people to get touches of the ball. And then we get to our second side stuff, and that's when we have different options of an on-ball screen or maybe a pass and a give-and-go out of the second side. But it's just trying to uh, loosen up the defense and then attack. Yeah, I like it. I like it. And with that, I guess, do you run a lot of different types of masking actions or mainly are you just coming down and going trail entry or how many different entries do you do? 
Yeah, we have a lot of different entries and yeah. the, the pressure release entries. You know, we have a pass to the strong side wing and there's a cut through a bit like the Spurs had uh, strong and strong and weak entries. If they're denying the, the trailer, which normally happens, we will dive him, um, you know, and lift up. We, we got entries from half court. If they run half court traps, we have entries for that. Uh, we have our post entry, which is a great pressure release to get cutters and get angles and, and create opportunities for our, our shooters out there. So, yeah, without just on top of the head, I get about six different entries straight away. Yeah, no, I imagine that's important, even just to, just as you said, pressure release, but also masking the actions and also setting up the action. So that leads into that next part, which is, like you talked about having elite score like you do. How do you blend in creating opportunities for a specific player, a specific matchup? I think as a coach, your job, uh, well, the way I see it, your job is to create opportunities for your best players. You know, we all say we want equal opportunity offense, but I, I want my best player shooting the ball. You know, I want him to take out of shots out of the offense. And I'm talking about coming down and just jacking the ball up and shooting it 25 times a game that no, he's got to work in the system. And when that happens, you can work off what the defense does. If they double team you or trap you or uh, blitz you, you can, the spacing is critical and the ball moves. Um, but we certainly want to create opportunities. So as a coach, it's my job to get our best players shots on the ball and when that's taken away we got to have a counter and when you do that that's when the players start to believe in the offense oh yeah, that works you're feeling involved uh, but that, and that's a big part of us we pass the ball to the open man uh, and you play unselfish like that and you know good things happen yeah, no doubt, no doubt, and uh, th- I guess the other part with it is uh, generally in the in the half court uh, dead ball situations, are there set starting points? But then in transition, are they running to spots, or are we just spacing where we space in terms of the flex? Yeah, our first option in transition is kick aheads. We want to pass the ball over the center line, obviously to our wings if we had it, or our uh, our big is going basket rim run. Uh, putting heat on the rib and he's crabbing out to the strong side, strong side post. Uh, that That's, you know, one of our best offenses, just our kicker heads and what that creates. And then you get into your drive and drift. Uh, and then when we, we want to get back into it, sometimes you get distorted in the transition. There might be two guards on the side. There might be two bigs not spacing. And our home base is always into our flex offense. It was four out, one at the rim. And we might occasionally have our guard right there at the rim run at the post. And uh, we might have our big out on the wing. So we might get our big guy cutting the first flex cut, which is the big guys defensively, that's strange for them. They're not protecting the basket. They're, all of a sudden they're out protecting the wing and then you've got a guard covering the basket, which is a different look. Um, we also get some opportunities out of that. So we always want to fall back into our flex alignment, but we also look for those kick aheads and quick, easy baskets in the first, uh, you know, five, six seconds we get the ball. Yeah, that's cool. And uh, such admiration for coaches who can get players to cut hard, especially when they're not going to get the ball. And that's got to be so important in this offense. So I'm wondering, even speaking more to maybe youth levels as well, but how do you teach speed of cuts and accountability to that speed? That's a great question. And that's an issue that we have. The, the best thing I can say to that, you've got to highlight that as a coach. You've got to highlight the areas that you want to see repeated. So if you've got little Jimmy makes a hard cut, doesn't touch, touch the ball at all, but that cut created an opportunity you got to praise that. And if you have video, you show it in video because all of a sudden, well, Jimmy's getting praised. He didn't shoot two points. But that cut is so vital to create opportunities for the next phase of the offense. And to get, as a coach, if you want things 
to be repeated at same as diving on the ball for loose ball. You know, the, the time out, you mate, that was great. You just hustled. You didn't get the ball, but that hustle, you know, if we do that across the floor, we're going to have a great game today. And that cut, anything that highlights the offense without scoring or the pass that leads to the assist, I think you're going to get traction from your players when you do that. And that's critical to do that because it's unselfish and sometimes they don't think that hard cut is a part of anything of the offense, but it's so important. Love that. Notice, notice progress, notice success, all those different things that go with that. And yeah, that's, that's tremendous. And the other thing as you're talking in, especially in relative to you level, like one of the advantages of flex seems to be that it can be broken down into manageable sequences. Like it's easy to develop kind of small sided games and different types of smaller actions out of it. I'm wondering if that's how you practice a lot of the speed of the decisions that have to take place. Yeah, and that that's how it evolves. You can't you can't put fifteen plays in at once and, and you just work to what the strength of your team is. If you've got a great shooting guard, you've got to create options for that shooting guard. If you've got a great post play, you want to put them in a in a situation or a good pick and roll. We have a good four man and a good two man. So we want to get those two guys in the pick and roll as as often as possible because they make really good decisions. They're both scorers and they're both unselfish. And you you got to put that in your offense. And I would stay with that as you're building your offense up. Stay with those two or three, you know, or four plays and build that and let the offense evolve. Don't, don't come in with 15, 16 plays and think you can be masters at everything because it's not going to happen. We started this offense as an early secondary offense to get some scores and to get some easy baskets when the defense is not there. Now it's involved. The guys have played it for a number of years. I can play off that and put some new plays in pretty soon, but uh, I would concentrate on five or six plays and lock them those in, the reads, the spacing, the crashing the glass to build confidence in your team. Is there any way that you practice differently with the juniors versus the seniors? in terms of more five-on-five with the olders or is it across the board more five-on-five or small-sided games or what? Yeah, we we do every day. We have uh, five minutes with no dribble in the half court, five-on-five, and and it's, it's, you know, it's messy. It's the spacing's terrible. The defense is up in your grill. And then we open it up another five minutes with one bounce allowed. And, you know, that's after the point guard is is past the ball. But we find that creates the spacing. It's often... Space and get open or get out. Don't clog up the laneways and look at the ball and wait. Just get spacing, get out, your hard cuts. On the screen down, on the pin down, we want to get that screen underneath the foul line uh, for the guards. If he's passed to the trailer, there's a flex cut and I'm pinning down. We want to get that screen down so it creates spacing for the, the big guy popping up. We want to create space and opportunity, and I think those two drills that we do most days really help that. It's fun to hear that. And uh, the other part, I guess, you mentioned earlier and I want to come back to is that you talked about scoring at the rim, which is obviously very important in the modern, well, any era of basketball. So I'm wondering, is there anything particularly that suits us for having a dominant scorer inside? Yeah, we, we have a lot of, um, you know, you can start him at the trailer position, uh, setting a pin down and then sealing straight away so he gets a seal inside the paint. Um, we, we've been fortunate to have some great post players in the past that could really seal and put a target. And if you've got shooters around them, have the shooters running off. If it's a non-shooter, you're going to struggle because they can help down on him but if you've got a shooter run him off your big guy because that creates space for him um and seal but yeah we have a duck in play we have um you know a a dribble handoff play uh, for our five to get to the post or a four to get to the post Uh, there's a lot of different areas that we have out of that and like i said we we want to throw the ball into the post 20 times a game or in the short corner and work off cutters and um, step-ups and 
Um, there's a lot of lot of stuff that the mind game probably doesn't do too much. You know, the excess perimeter play off the dribble, we, we really like to hit the post in the short quarter and work off that. Coach, it's great to hear the contrast and, and the different ways that you can score to flex and tremendous success proven through what you've done in Perth. What I'm curious about, as you mentioned this, is the non-shooter. What do you do to adapt this offense to a non-shooter? And that, that's where you've got to put him in a position to hurt, especially, you know, big game. They will help off a non-shooter uh, more so than what they've done in the past. So, it's either finding a spot on the floor that you're comfortable. And I'll talk about our point guard. When, when I first got here, he shot 28% from the three. And then I looked at all these threes and they were kind of random at the top. And I went to him and said, where do you shoot the best from? And he said, well, the corner. And I looked at He didn't shoot that many shots in the corner. So the next year I said, okay, well, that's where we're going to park you. We're going to get through our first phase. And now when we get to our second uh, second side action, we're going to get you in the corner. So if the defense does help off, you're going to get uncontested three. And he worked on that all the time. And he finished up shooting over 40% on the three ball. Um, and then we had another guy that wasn't such a good corner sh- shot three. So we would put him in the dunker spot. Even though that he was a point guard, we put him in the dunker spot so they couldn't help off as often from that position. And then he had, you know, if the defense, he'd get an open layup, he'd be there for the rebound, the tap outs. And it really just kept the defense honest where you put those guys. So you can't just leave them out in the court and just hope because the defense will, um, can make the, make the moves and make it harder for you to score. Uh, it's, 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 it's cool to hear that that adaption and because uh, we always have to think about that, especially the lower levels. So uh, the other part is, I'm curious, do you spend a lot of time, you talked about playing with a guard at the rim in that situation. Do you spend a lot of time in general on working on your guards posting up or finishing at the rim? Not really. No, to be honest with you, not, not really with that. It, it's more, um, we don't get a lot, but if we do get a, if we've got a, um, a strength of a guards that's a really good post up, we will throw it in. We have, you know, if it's a three man, we'll run him off the flex cut and pass him straight into the post. And then we have some options out of that from the perimeter guys, either, you know, a, a screen for the shooter coming off up high. You know, there's a bit of misdirection, Euro stuff, but we will throw the ball into our guard if we feel that's a strength of ours. We just haven't done it the last couple of seasons. And coach, I can't let you go without asking you, what is your one favorite counter in a situation in flex? Do you have a one that you just love the most? I, I probably, yeah, I probably, after a timeout, I love to get an open shot for um, our shooters. And after a while, after you, if you're running the flex, you're going to run, you know, 40, 50 cuts a game on that first flex cut, especially in the second half. The guys, yeah, you're running this. I know what you're doing. The deep end get, and then it's running a counter. So after that first flex cut, the shooter puts his head underneath the rim and now he has a choice to go back the same way he came from or to have a big guy set in the screen at the foul line and he has a choice of going either off. Uh, obviously, the wing has got to be in the deep corner to take your defensive help away. But that's a good quick hitter that we found very successful coming out of a break. I love it. I love it. So, so many fun things. And you must enjoy coaching this offense, obviously, to keep going with it. And uh, I, Coach, I cannot thank you enough for letting us deep dive a little bit on this flex offense. I've enjoyed it. it uh Let's me to look at things again and, um, you know, we were after getting an easy shot for our guys to make us all good coaches. Well, I can't encourage coaches enough, if, especially if you have synergy access or whatnot, to be able to watch uh, some of your games and some of your clips. And it's impressive, especially the hard cutting. Yeah, well, that's something we work on. It's, it's the little things. It's the cutting angles. It's the speed of the cuts. It's our spacing. Um, don't, don't forget that because it's a big part of why it's successful. Amazing. Amazing. Coach, we wish you all the best. And, uh, you know, thank you for taking the time and sharing the game with us. No worries. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it.
Thanks for listening. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and to give the Basketball Podcast and this week's guest a shout out on social media to show your support for us sharing the game. And to stay up to date on all things Basketball Immersion, subscribe to our newsletter at basketballimmersion.com newsletter.